Meccano! Hi. If you want even more Meccano goodness, why don't you check out my Patreon channel? And please like and subscribe and leave a comment below. I post updates in the community section, not only for this week's Patreon build, but also for what I'm currently working on. Thank you, and back to the build. Hi, and welcome back. This week's build is the Hammerhead Crane from the Crane Multi-Kit set, and is the seventh build of the set, and the 13th build for YouTube. Up to this point, my builds, I've been focusing on getting the Patreon builds up to the same volume as the YouTube content for the last few months. I built and filmed this in June of 2021, and I'm sitting down in December of 2021, two weeks before Christmas, to write the script. And this is where the journey surprises me at times. When I first started this project, I thought I'd just whack out a video a week and that's it. But it has taken a lot longer to get anywhere than I thought it would. The script writing side I knew would be difficult. After all, I am profoundly dyslexic. Each script is around 3,000 words and I do two per week. Without the computer, this would not have happened at all. Voicing the scripts, again, I knew wouldn't be easy. As I have an underlying speech impediment, I wouldn't call it a stutter or a stammer, it's something else. But I think the hardest thing to overcome for, for me is the drive needed to complete this task. I've lived with depression for a long time. And at times it just takes all my energy, mentally and emotionally, to move forwards. Each milestone attained from completing the scripts, some 72,000 words to date, filming, voicing, researching and so much more. Each of these points that should bring some sense of achievement, don't. Each time it feels like a voice saying, What's the point? You're going to fail anyway. So why am I here still trying to move forward? Firstly, I am of my bloodline. Giving in is not acceptable. You push forward. You fight. You strive. If needed, you move the mountains to get to where you want to be. But giving in is just not done. That means you've failed. In the worst possible way. You failed. Not because you didn't strive to achieve. But because you were too scared to stand and to try. S secondly, I drew a line in the sand in 2019. Enough. I've had enough of letting what is an illness rule my life. So, each small victory, with one adding on top of the other... I will reprogram my brain to see the positive. I have days when I fail and days when I don't. If I fail, it is because my reach is not long enough to grasp what I want, but at least I have reached. Better to fail that way than sit by the fire saying, I nearly did this or that, but I couldn't because life was set against me. And what does this have to do with a hammerhead crane and Meccano? Nothing. And yet at the same time, everything. If you have a dream, reach for it. Otherwise, what's the point of living? And in many ways, these giant cranes, these monsters that inhabited our shipyards, were the builders of dreams. They helped piece together, part by part, the largest ships of their time. Without the heavy lift abilities that was provided, our dreams of the early part of the 20th century would not have happened. And most of these leviathans have gone.
their remains fossilised in archive photographs to be viewed by historians at a later date. The impact that these cranes had though should not be forgotten. But in the power that they had was also a weakness. They were built into the very place in which they lived. They were of that yard and nowhere else. The work had to be brought to the crane and a never ending game of shuffle the ship was played out around the feet of these giants of engineering. And as shipyard building ebbed and flowed with the tide of business, the work that was needed to keep these cranes lifting went. A hammerhead crane is a cantilever crane, or simply put, where the forces at one end of the jib are, by Newton's third law, absorbed by the other end of the jib. On the, the River Tyne at Wall's End, the North Eastern Marine Engineering Company, or NEM crane, was constructed in 1909 by Sir William Owell of Glasgow and built by Stotharth and Pitt of Bath. It became a local landmark to the skyline of the North East. Standing at 125 feet or 38 metres, with a jib length of 245 feet or, or 74 metres, the crane was proclaimed to be the largest in the world at that point. Able to lift up to 150 tonnes, must have been a wonderful and awe-inspiring sight as it, as it worked its life in the shipyard. Sadly, a shipbuilding on the Tyne died, the work leaving the North East seemingly forever, the Nem Crane became silent. In 1989, it was added to the National Heritage List for England, listed as a Grade 2 construction. Only 42 of these cranes were ever built. This one of two left in the River Tyne, complete with all the original machinery, still intact and in working order. Sadly, in the early 1990s, the crane was controversially delisted and later dismantled for scrap. Nestled in the Port of Cowes on the Isle of Wight is the J.S. Wight shipyard and the Hammerhead crane built by Babcock and Wilcox of Renfrew, Glasgow. The crane was constructed in 1912 and, to my understanding, is the last of the Scottish designed and built pre-World War II hammerheads left in England. The crane has an 80 ton lift ability and was used to lift boilers and heavy machinery into Royal Naval vessels built in the local area. During World War I the dockyard built 27 destroyers and then a further 26 in the Second World War. HMS Cavalier is the last remaining British destroyer from World War II and is currently berthed at Chatham Docks. Cavalier was constructed in 1944 with maybe the darkest days of the Second World War seemingly over. When the dockyard closed in 1965 the crane was still operational and carried on working till 2004 being used to test the self-writing abilities of lifeboats. Eight years older than Cavalier, the Polish destroyer O.R.P. Blaskowitska, meaning lightning. I'm sorry if I can't pronounce the name correctly, my Polish is not good at the best of times. Over her life, she regularly visited cows and can now be seen in the Polish port of Gdynia, where she is being preserved for a younger generation to see. In early May of 1942, she was being refitted at J.S. White Shipyard in Cowes. The weather report for the night of the 5th of May 1942 describes that the south coast of England in the Cowes area is to be light to moderate south to southwest wind, fair or fine apart from fog patches over the coast, rather warm during the day. The cloud base is 4,000 feet. 
The moon is three quarters full and waning. Cows is blacked out, with only the light of the moon and the stars to glint on the rooftops. In the low light, the hammerhead crane standing tall would have been visible, as from the sea, a force of Luftwaffe bombers thundered to their objective. The mission is to carpet the dockyard with a mixture of incendiary and high explosive ordnance, destroying two destroyers being built in the shipyard. The dark grey shape of Blaskovichka, hidden under the hammerhead, would be invisible to the approaching force. No alarm was raised. The raid was a surprise. 22.55 hours, the AA guns on the island opened fire. The air raid alarm was sounded. 2300 hours, having found the target, both east and west cows began to burn due to incendiary rounds being dropped. C Commander Vorchkek Fransky, the captain in charge of the Blaskovitska, reports that by 2335 the ship was surrounded by fires which illuminated the whole dockyard and the two destroyers being built there ordering three valiant sailors to the lee side of the river to light smoke candles, he tries to save them. It is only due to the courageous action of three men the dockyard was continuously obscured, denying the bombers a clear target. With the raid still continuing, he sends a further 20 sailors ashore to fight fires that now raged inside the dockyard. At midnight, with the Saunders Row factory now alight, C Commander Fransky sends 30 more of his crew to fight fires, and still the raid continues. By 0020, the raid is over, with 50 of his 180 crew already ashore. Commander Fransky sends a further 30 men to help fight other fires now burning in the yards. At 04.15, the second and much heavier raid strikes. At the height of the raid, a working party is sent ashore to fight an oil fire raging out of control in the dockyard. His gunners having to fire by the sound of the aircraft alone, as the main fire control tower for the destroyer had been damaged during a previous combat engagement, hence why she was in the yard. Maintaining a steady rate of fire for the time of the raids, having slipped to their berth, the ship was adrift in the channel. With no time to start the boilers, their role was to lay down continuous fire, forcing the raiding aircraft to climb higher and lose their accuracy. So bearing to targets had to be guessed in the dark, fire, smoke and terror of the ensuing combat, even as they are dive bombed by enemy bombers. The 47mm anti-aircraft guns are so hot by this point that the crew are pouring water over the barrels to cool them. A number of them are injured due to the extreme heat. Firing over 2,000 rounds of 47mm ammunition and 10,500 rounds of 13.2mm ammunition. Days previously, Commander Fransky had requested that his ammunition levels be topped up. His request had been refused due to the risk of explosion in the yard. So, he'd taken it upon himself to acquire spare ammunition through any means possible, not wishing to be a sitting target to any enemy air raid that might happen. His foresight not only saved his command, but the two destroyers being built, and undoubtedly many lives and cows. This was not the first time he turned his ship into a floating anti-aircraft base, as a year earlier, while being refitted in Glasgow, he did the same. His bravery, and that of his crew, was noted in dispatches. Commander Fransky was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Throughout my researches, crane building and Glasgow are linked together. So many of these engineering pieces are linked to the city. It is undoubtedly due to the need of the skills for shipbuilding on the banks of the Clyde. 
but I wonder if also the heritage of Scotland runs in the creations that sprang to life. From the drawing boards of the engineers. For truly these are, these are giants, the stuff of legends. Which is very true, because there are two types of tower cantilever cranes, both at times mistakenly called hammerheads. The type that lived south of the border, the English cranes, were fixed in one place. Work was brought to them. Their domain was chained to the length of their jib. But north of the border, there lived the Titans. Named after the gods that roamed the earth before the Greek Olympian gods came to power, these are colossal lifting machines that could move on rails. 42 Titan cranes were designed and built in the early part of the 20th century. 40 of them by Sir William Arrell. 27 of them were located in Britain. One designed by the Glasgow Electric Crane and Hoist Company and built by Motherwell Bridge Engineering Company, which was exported to Nagasaki. The crane survived the atomic bomb blast when the US attacked the city at the end of World War II and is the only surviving Titan crane still in use in the world. The other crane was built by Babcock and Wilcox of Renfrew and exported to Singapore. The lift capacity of these cranes were all above the 150 ton mark, with sun coming in at 200 tons. And they truly are giants. The pictures on the internet of the John Brown and Company crane located on Clyde Bank are awe-inspiring. The crane is open to visitors and is one of the oldest surviving titans in the world, built in 1907 with a 200-ton lift capacity. It worked in the construction of famous ships HMS Hood and Repulse, RMS Lusitania, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, also the QE2. In 2013, four world-leading engineering societies designated the crane as an international historic civil and mechanical engineering landmark and what a landmark it is mind you i don't fancy bungee jumping off it and yes you can i just don't have faith in the idea of a piece of elastic stopping me from hitting the ground at great speed and not snapping there is only one more crane to build in the crane multi-kit set the dockyard crane and then the set is complete. When I was first starting the design of this channel in 2019, I built this model one Sunday afternoon. The cabling of the drum for the jib trolley had caused me so many problems. And in the end, it turned out that I just hadn't wound the drum tight enough so that it could both pay out and feed in at the same time. Here I am, the penultimate build for this kit. I have already filmed the dockyard crane. I just have the script to write and edit and... Right, okay, there's still quite a lot to do. It is a year and a half after my father's passing and 43 years after he gave me the kit one Christmas as a present. And as I sit here finishing this script, Nursing a, a broken right little finger. Do you realise how much you use your little finger? Especially when you type? I can almost hear the sarcastic comment. Well, it's taken you long enough. And it has been an interesting journey. So much history that I find is still there to be seen. I find my bucket list changing. I want to visit now these places that made my country what it is. I'm inspired to think that so much was achieved by so many, that these inventions still today, more than a century after they were forged in fire and steel, still provide service to the world. Stand there to remind us to reach for our dreams, to weather the storms and the conflict in our lives.
that we can survive the things that happen and continue to live and be productive long after others think we are finished. That, in our darkest moments, we need to have the knowledge that light will always follow. <laughs>